Welcome to today's Friday field trip to the Melbourne Museum in Melbourne, Australia. And today's uh, museum is very special because if you check out behind me, um, you'll see that there's a, a lot of dinosaurs. So hopefully we've got some dinosaur fans on the call today. And, um, and hopefully um, that is why you're here um, for those dinosaurs uh, that are behind me in the Melbourne Museum. So we also have a very special guest on the call today, um, and she's going to help us out with some uh, fun facts. Uh, she's a student at the university or Ohio State University, and she is majoring in geology. And she is actually on. Um, she's going to go back to a uh, dinosaur uh, dig later on this summer, and uh, they're going to be um, uh, digging up uh, matador. matador? Bones? Mammoth. Mammoth. Mammoth bones. See, I want to preface this field trip by saying I am going to butcher a lot of dinosaur names. <laughs> Molly is here to help. Molly, do you want to talk about a little bit about what you do um, to our uh, to our guests today? Yeah, of course. So hi, everybody. My name is Molly, and I'm a paleontologist at Ohio State. So if you don't know what a paleontologist is, it's someone who studies fossils, uh, which can be trilobites, brachiopods, dinosaurs, mammoths, any animals that lived long, long, long ago is what I study. Um, those are typically found in rocks. So I also have a degree in geology. So I'm partially a geologist, partially a paleontologist. Uh, but I also get to do some super fun stuff, like get to talk to you guys. And I also get to help take care of all the fossil bones we have in the Orton Museum on the OSU's campus. So if you have any questions for me, you can feel free to give me a shout out or you can send a chat and I can respond. But I'm going to let Elliot get our field trip started. I'm excited. And, I, and I'm going to uh, direct any questions about dinosaurs directly over to Molly anytime you have any <laughs> questions. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what you're looking at right now. Um, actually, the, the front is over here if I spin it around. Um, you'll see uh, this is the entrance to the Melbourne Museum. Um, it's in a uh, particular place in Melbourne called the Carlton Gardens and the museum is part of Museum Victoria. Um, it includes Science Works and the Immigration Museum. So it's kind of like if you've ever been to uh, a few weeks ago we went to the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in uh, Washington DC. So this is kind of like Melbourne, Australia's version of the Smithsonian. There's a whole bunch of museums um, all in the same area uh, in Melbourne. And uh, so this particular museum, uh, the, the Melbourne Museum of Natural History, uh, holds millions of objects in their collections. And their objects help us understand the world around us by looking at what has been going on in the past. And uh, sometimes it's a really, really far past. And so the Melbourne Museum, which, like I said, you're looking at right now, uh, was opened right here in the year 2000. Um, it's it's very, very long history, though. The museum has been around since 1854, um, and uh, it was opened in Latrobe Street, Melbourne. Inside the Melbourne Museum, there are many ex exhibitions looking at history, science, and culture. There's also a living forest uh, inside the Melbourne Museum. Uh, on the other side, which we were looking at before, we have the Royal Exhibition Building. The Royal Exhibition was opened in 1880. That was a long time ago. And it was host to the Melbourne International Exposition. Exhibition. The Exhibition Building also hosted the first ever Australian Federal Parliament in 1901. The building is listed in the World Heritage Register as a protected site. So this uh, building is kind of like... Um, if we, uh, like the Capitol building in Washington DC, if you ever go there and you see the big giant Capitol building, this is kind of like the old version of uh, Australia's Capitol building. So next up, we're gonna go inside the museum and start our di dinosaur walk. So the dinosaur walk is an ex exhibition inside Melbourne Museum that has many dinosaurs and other extinct animals. Uh, you can see many skeletons of these, these creatures and uh, as we walk back in time. Um, so it's really cool how they're, they're put in throughout the museum and you, kind of, you can walk around them and walk under them and really get a good view of it. Uh, much of the information you hear today comes from the work of paleontologists who are scientists who study fossils. 
which is exactly what we have, who, who, what if Molly does is that as well. We have one with us. How amazing is that? <laughs> so first up, over here, uh, the smaller of the two uh, dinosaurs there is called the Tobi Tarbosaurus. The Tarbosaurus Batar means alarming lizard. And its ferocious dinosaur lives in Mongolia, which is uh, around China, north of China. And has a large skull and powerful jaws like the Trinosaurus rex. But it's much lighter and not as top heavy. The Tarbosaurus lived 70 million to 65 million years ago in the late Cretaceous period. Why are the arms so small? We always joke about, a lot of people joke about the Trinosaurus rex arms being so small. There's there's comics about it and little funny pictures about a Trinosaurus rex. The Tarbosaurus uh, also has very short arms. Uh, they can't even reach its mouth, though. the Tarbosaurus mouth. It can't even reach the mouth of, of the animal. The animal is a carnivore, or is a carnivore, which means it, it eats meat. It eats meat. And this one is a, a cast made from a fossil skeleton of a teenage Tarbosaurus. It's not even fully grown. So it's kind of a smaller. Um, it does get much larger, or it did get much larger. Um, I, I have to use past tense today because the last time I checked, there are no dinosaurs running around outside. So, well, there are dinosaur relatives running around. That is true. That is very true. I actually made a post today on our Facebook page about uh, because birding week is going on right now. And, uh, and I made the joke that, that birds are just tiny little dinosaurs anyway. They are. <laughs> so birds are actually related to dinosaurs and one of the most, the birds that's the closest is a chicken. So if you have chickens in your yard, you actually have dinosaurs running around, which is that, pretty cool. And that explains why so many people are afraid of chickens, because they're, mm -hmm. they're little mini dinosaurs. So <laughs> next up we have the Gallimimus. The Gallimimus is uh, the largest of the bird mimicking reptiles. It has a beak with no teeth and was probably an omnivore, meaning it ate both meat and plants. The Gallimimus lived 70 million to 65 million years ago in the late Cretaceous period, about the same time um, as the, uh, the Tarbosaurus as well. The Gallimimus has very strong legs. If you check that out, the legs are almost, the legs are almost uh, half, if not more than half the size of, of their body. It was a very fast runner. Uh, these powerful legs look like fast running animals today, like ostriches. Uh, it had long arms with flexible fingers and claws, which could be used for digging, collecting food, and holding down prey. Next up, the little small guy there, we have the uh, Dionysus. Uh, the Dionysus helped change the way we think about dinosaurs. People used to think dinosaurs were sluggish animals until paleontologist John Olstrom. Do you know John, Molly? I know the name, but I do not know him. Is he like your, is he like your hero? He, uh, uh, he might not be my hero, but I'm sure he's someone's some, hero. Someone's hero. Uh, <laughs> he studied the, the skeleton of the dyna, Dynamysis and uh, discovered dinosaurs can be fast-moving, agile predators. The Dynamysis uh, lived way long time ago, 118 to 110 bil million years ago uh, in, the, uh, in the Crustaceous period as well. Uh, we are going to to another side here. The dinosaur skeletons range from large this section and a wide range of uh, dinosaur displays um, on on scale. You can see that the top side of one right there it kind of spans almost the entire room. So the first one up is a really, really tiny little one. That tiny dinosaur is called the Hypsilophton. The Hypsilophton was a small, fast running dinosaur. It was not much larger than a cat, running upright on its back legs and using its tail for balance. The Hypsilophton was an herbivore and lived 136 to 112 million years ago in the early Cretaceous period. These are, You'll see that. What, there was a type of, um, there was a type of, of dinosaur like this on the latest uh, um, Jurassic Park. I, I can't remember if this was the one. But oh, so you're thinking of a raptor? 
Well, there was an even smaller one on on even smaller one. Not, the raptor was a little bit larger. Well, see, and the and Jurassic World actually made the raptor too big. Um, That's raptor, what I heard. Yeah, so we actually know from raptor skeletons that they were much smaller than what they portrayed in the movies. Um, but I'm trying to think of what the smaller one is that's in the movie. I haven't seen it in a very long time. Yeah. So the uh, next one is uh, we uh, we're looking at right here, um, the one that's uh, right in the middle there. Um, so this is a Scintosaurus. Scintosaurus. Scintosaurus could walk either two or four legs, and a fully grown creature was approximately 10 meters long. It lived in an area known as China, in the area known as China. <laughs> uh, the Scintosaurus lived 83 to 71 million years ago in the late Cretaceous period. Oh, this one's pretty interesting. This, this is the, uh, the duck build. Uh, duck-billed dinosaur. The uh, that that's the, it's the same dinosaur. It's the Sinaichosaurus Sinich uh, had a large bill like a duck. It was an herbivore and used its massive grinding teeth to eat tough leaves. The Sinaichosaurus had a large crest on its head. They also made distinctive sounds, which they used to identify each other. So it was like a, it was like forms of talking uh, back and forth between them. So on the floor, you can actually see a uh, part of uh, what Molly is very familiar with, uh, dinosaur digs. So um, in this pit, uh, it's the fossil of a hadrosaur, um, which is another duck-billed dinosaur. It was discovered by paleontologists from Canada. Uh, the fossil contains not only dinosaur bones, but also dinosaur skin. Uh, the skin is very useful because it shows that some dinosaur had scales. So up here, uh, you kind of see the back of this one. Uh, fossils gave paleontologists an idea of what life was like millions of years ago. Paleontologists use this evidence to construct theories about how dinosaurs lived. This information helps us make displays like those that we see in museums. The interesting thing about museums is typically when you go and see uh, dinosaur skeletons or mammoth skeletons, uh, they're typically called casts. So they're exact replicas of what the skeletons would look like, but it's incredibly rare to find a complete skeleton. So sometimes we have to be creative um, and be artists and recreate the skeleton with as much bone material as we can. But sometimes paleontologists won't put all the bones out on display uh, because we have to have bones back in the back part of the museum to study. So that's why there's a bunch of different people that work at the museum doing different things. Uh, but one of the jobs is creating these really cool exhibits. Very interesting, thank you. The, the, the next one up is this one with a really long neck. You can't even see its head, it's so it's got such a long neck. This is the uh, mommy chisaurus. The mommy chisaurus was a herbivore, it's also plant eating. A uh, dinosaur with a very long neck, which could be up to 11 meters long, and they would have walked with their neck stretched out horizontally. So a lot of times, we, the, one of the one of the uh, is it um uh, I can't think of the dinosaur, the really famous one with the huge long neck that's upright. Molly, help me. Brachiosaurus. Out. The Brachiosaurus, yes. So when we see those in in a lot of movies and stuff, that their head is upright. Um, this uh, dinosaur would have actually had their head down um, like that, and it'd be really straight. It'd be like the size of like a bus <laughs> that's walking along. Um, it's crazy. Um, so uh, their long tail could also be used uh, as a whip, um, so a weapon. Uh, you know, a lot of these, the, this dinosaur and the dinosaur before was uh, were both herbivores, and so they uh, they didn't have teeth or anything to to be able to attack any other things that were trying to attack them. So they had to use, you know, to use their bodies, their big massive bodies to be able to, to, uh, to fend off other creatures. So now next up we have, we finally get to see the head. The Mamichosaurus and uh, the Mamichosaurus had a spoon, had spoon shaped teeth which were used for stripping off uh, leaves and plants. Uh, like a lot of other plant eaters, it have it needed to eat almost continuously to maintain its energy. So a lot of the difference between herbivores and and um, 
and uh, uh, carnivores is that you can get a lot more energy off of off of being a carnivore, off of being meat eaters. Whereas the plants do provide energy, but you have to eat a lot of them, and their bodies are so huge that the plants had to, they had to eat a lot of plants in order to get that energy to keep themselves moving. Um, so they almost they ate pretty much all the time. Do we do anybody does anybody know anybody that just eats all the time? Some people, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I, uh, I I know some people that just eat constantly. Um, so the uh, uh, the the Mammutosaurus lived 160 to 145 million years ago in the uh, late Jurassic period. Okay, next up we have the flying reptiles, and these are all. Before we move on. These are all. So, kind I, wanted of to know, I know Elliot's been saying Jurassic and Cretaceous, so we know that there's these kind of crazy big terms. Paleontologists have different times and history that we name certain things. So when the dinosaurs were alive, there were three time periods. First, it was the Triassic, the Jurassic, and then the Cretaceous. So those time periods are when dinosaurs were around. Those are those big words that Elliot's been using. Thank you. I've been using and butchering, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing good. <laughs> the flying reptiles inhabited the earth at the same time as many dinosaurs you're seeing, uh, you've seen before. They're actually not dinosaurs. Instead, they belong to a group of known as uh, Tesaurus, uh, or the, the uh, help me out on the pronunciation of that. Uh, that is, um, yeah, that is. Pterosaur? What's that? Pterosaur? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's like, yeah, yeah, pterosaurus. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was... So if you've ever seen the land before time, Petrie? Pterosaurus rex, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so pterosaurus is uh, where carnivore, carnivorous flying reptiles. Okay, next week on the, on the field trip, if you join me, I'm going to pick one that has super easy words to pronounce. I need to practice my dictionary today. Uh, so they're flying reptiles, and uh, they had skin-covered wings. The first one up, and uh, we're looking at it right now, actually, uh, that is the uh, the Quetzalcoatlus. That's so, oof, that is. So, is it the that Q is, one? What's that? Does it start with, does it start with a Q? It does start with a Q. Uh, Quileocosis. Quesliosaurus. Yeah. Quesliosaurus. Que Quesliosaurus. That sounds about right. Yeah, it's it's that's a hard one. That is a hard one. It's the largest of the flying reptiles on display. It's named after an Aztec god. Well, that explains why it's so uh, yeah so hard. It may have been the largest yeah. animal ever. The Quetzalotaurus. Quetzalotaurus has had quite a small body compared to its massive wings. So if you look at the, if you look at the uh, cast here, um, the wings almost took, took up, even the, even the bones that, that made up the wings took up almost uh, the, most of the body, most of the, the, that animals, or that bird's body. I know you guys can't see my full body, but I'm about five foot tall. Uh, he was probably 10 foot tall. So imagine two of me, and maybe a little, little bit more. Uh, there's a really cool life-size model at the Field Museum of Chicago. And if I stand underneath of it, I don't even make it to like half of his wings. It's incredible. I've seen, I, I've seen that one at the Field Museum before. Pretty amazing. Yeah, huge, terrifying bird. Yeah. Well, well like yeah, and not only, not only it's huge, it's also, it's also a meat eater. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's not afraid to take a bite out of you if you, if, if, <laughs> Uh, if we all lived back then, we would not be happy to see these guys flying around. Uh, it's believed the Quetzalcoatlus uh, lived mostly inland, and uh, no fossils have been found near a coast. It was a carnivore and it hunted small animals, such as small dinosaurs. It lived uh, 70 to uh, 65 million years ago in the Cretaceous period. Next up. Over there in the distance, we have the uh, pterodon. The pterodon was a carnivore, just like the, the animal before this. 
Uh, this animal had a wingspan of three meters and mostly ate fish. Uh, it may have hunted in the water by doing a belly landing. The pterodon lived 90 to 70 million years ago in the Crustaceous period. So it flew mostly over water and it would kind of, uh, if you've seen, um, if you've seen videos of um, the, uh, what's the bird with the big giant beak, Molly, help me out. Pelicans. The pelican, yeah, I don't know why I couldn't think of that. The pelican, if you've seen videos of the pelican scooping in with and getting all the water and bird, or water and... Think of Finding Nemo. Um, then it's kind of the same thing with this animal. Uh, didn't have, I don't think it had that quite, that giant beak type thing, but it did have, uh, it did swoop down low against the water. Okay, next up we have the, over there in the distance, we have the Anyawera. The Anyawera is a, another carnivorous flying reptile. The Anyawera was a fish eater, uh, which used its long sturdy jaws to snatch up fish from the sea as it flew over the water had sharp teeth to hold fish in its mouth. The Anyawera was an expert flyer and it would by running along the ground on its back legs and taking off when it had enough speed. The Anyawera uh, lived 112 to 99 million years ago during the Crustaceous period. Next up, we have some dinosaurs that are uh, specific to uh, Australia. So uh, you uh, you might be might be curious as to know that that there were dinosaurs that lived in Australia, and an Australian paleontologist assisted by amateur dinosaur hunters. Uh, I want that as a hobby. That'd be a fun hobby. Uh, <laughs> discoveries of dinosaur fossils across Australia that show rich and diverse uh, Australia's dinosaur population. We even have a dinosaur named after our national airline. Anybody know? Qantas. I'm pretty sure it's Qantas. Molly, you can fact check that and prove me wrong. Okay. <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> uh, this is, well, yeah, this is the, the first one up. I, I know it's right now. The first one up is known as the Qantasaurus. Um, and uh, the Qantasaurus uh, is, the, is the, uh, and this is actually kind of cool in, in the museum, it doesn't show a video of it, but this is an animatronic Quantosaurus, so it actually moves around inside that exhibit. Um, and uh, it shows what it could have looked like, uh, what it probably looked like back, uh, back when it was around. And it was a small uh, herbivorous dinosaur that lived in the forests of Victoria, which at the time was located in the Antarctic Circle and was very dark and it was a very, very uh, uh, cold climate as well. You check out in the log there, there's another, there's another Quantasaurus. The Quantasaurus had a beak-like mouth for nipping vegetation, which uh, with rigid teeth for chewing. It ran on powerful legs and used a tail for balance. Discovered in 1996 near Everlock, it's named after, it, it is named after the airline Qantas. See, yeah, I was ahead. It lived approximately 120 million years ago in the Crustaceous period. There's some fossils over here in this display. Uh, these fossils help paleontologists piece together a picture of how dinosaurs lived millions of years ago and give us a glimpse of the time before humans, uh, right up until the extinction of dinosaurs about uh, 65 million years ago. Up here, this guy here, the, the uh, Mudab Mudaborosaurus, the Mudaborosaurus is a large plant-eating dinosaur. It was approximately seven meters long and two and a half meters tall. It lived in the forest of Australia and was here during the Crustaceous period of 145 million to 65 million years ago. So this is something interesting about uh, um, the, uh, that, that dinosaur. So how, how exactly do you name a dinosaur? And, and Molly can go into this a little bit in the detail. Um, this, the cast of this fossil is found near central Queensland, an area in Australia in the 1960s. The Mudaborosaurus is named after the town of Mudaburra, 
at which it was discovered. The fossil is one of the most complete dinosaur skeletons discovered in Australia. You want to tell everyone how, how you kind of go about naming dinosaurs after you find fossils? Yeah, of course. So when you find some fossils, the first thing you have to do is figure out if it is a species or that we already know about. So whether it's, you know, a T-Rex or a Stegosaurus or Apothosaurus, any of the stuff we already know about. But if it's not, and you can sh prove that it's not, it has to be renamed. So the first part of the name is the genus. So T-Rex, the genus name is Tyrannosaurus. So there's a bunch of different Tyrannosauruses, and then their species names is that next name, that Rex part. And sometimes if it's a brand new species that no one's ever discovered, you get to name the Rex part. So if I ever found a dinosaur, I would definitely name it Mollysaurus. Definitely would be. Because I think that would be great. So there's going to be a Mollysaurus uh, uh, dinosaur skeleton out there somewhere. Some, oh, I hope so. Someday. <laughs> Next up, in the, in a uh, we have the Australian uh, megafauna. So the megafauna of Australia lived here along with uh, long after dinosaurs came extinct, 65 million years ago. Many of these massive animals resemble some of the animals we live we see living in Australia today, such as kangaroos, wombats, possums, the megafauna, they, they, in, they're in Australia, they were in Australia to approximately 2 million years ago. They're most likely uh, to share the continent with the first people, um, and uh, they became extinct approximately 40,000 years ago. So first up, and this is uh, a lot of this stuff here is, is what, um, is is what you guys are digging up in uh, in South Dakota, North Dakota? Yes. Yeah. And, and so there's a lot of things we can dig up in Ohio. Yeah, yeah, and a, and a lot of these more more uh, I say more modern animals uh, because they were, they they were around a little bit shorter time than what what some of the dinosaurs were. Yeah. So geologic time is split up into three big groups. Uh, so the later two groups that we're talking about, the Mesozoic is when dinosaurs lived, and currently we live in the Cenozoic. Uh, so that's when you had mammoths around and saber-toothed cats and all those really cool animals you see in like the movie Ice Age. Um, but we also have more of our modern animals uh, like crocodiles and turtles and stuff that we see nowadays were really diverse during this time period. So the first one that we're looking at here is, is the Diperdon. Uh, the, the Diperdon was a giant marsupial uh, named by the, by, by the, actually, it's actually named after, it means two, two forward teeth. Uh, it's the largest marsupial ever, similar to the size of a rhinoceros, though it resembles a large wombat. And uh, it's about three meters long and about two meters high at, at shoulder height and it weighed two tons. So marsupial, also some marsupials that are popular are um, the, um, man, I'm blanking on the, the cute little the koala bear. The koala bear is a marsupial. Um, also a um, um, kangaroo is a marsupial. Those are kind of, and then wombat, of course, um, is very, very much a uh, Australian uh, animal as well. Sugar gliders are also marsupials. And those What's that? Sugar gliders. Um, I'm oh, sure yeah. People yeah, have heard of those. Tiny. A lot of people have them as pets, uh, but those are also marsupials. Yeah. So over here, we're going to check out, they had a very, very powerful, powerful claws for digging. The Diperdon had strong claws on its front feet for digging up roots. It was an herbivore and it lived in scrubland of, of family groups up to 12. Um, it almost certainly lived at the same time as humans. Diperdon became extinct around 45,000 years ago. I've actually seen um, pictures of, of uh, what they thought that it would look like um, with, uh, you know, fully skinned and all that kind of stuff. And they're, they're kind of creepy looking uh, because they're, they're huge. And uh, to think that they were around at the same time as, as humans, that you'd be walking around with these giant things. You know, a lot of people are afraid of mice and rats. Imagine having one of these, these things come around. 
Okay, uh, over here, then we have the uh, uh, Magdalena. The Magdalena was the largest land lizard ever in, in Australia. It was approximately five and a half meters long and weighed about 600 kilograms. It would have ambushed its prey and torn it to pieces using its very large claws and serrated curved teeth. So you can check out its teeth there uh, in the humongous claws. Uh, that would also be a very frightening animal um, to, uh, to, come in, to come in contact with. Uh, the, uh, the Magdalena most likely lived in grassland and open woodland. Uh, although it, it may have been uh, partially aquatic, it became extinct before the peak of the last ice age when Australia was becoming drier. That may have led to less food for the Magdalena to survive on. So it's partially aquatic. Um, if that doesn't make you scared to go in any, any body of water back then, I don't know what would. Uh, having that thing swim around uh, would be absolutely frightening. Uh, so there's a lot more to explore in the in the museum. Um, that is uh, that is the end of our end of our virtual field trip, though. If you're ever in Australia, which it is on one of my top 10 lists of places to go. I'd love to go to Australia sometime. And you're in the Melbourne area, I'd highly recommend uh, checking out this museum. Um, with that being said, uh, it is the end. Uh, Molly, you have anything to add? Or anything so that if you guys have any questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Yeah, you're, if you have any questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Um, also, if you guys are interested in paleontology or geology and want to see more of this kind of stuff, um, later on this summer, uh, the Orton Geological Museum on OSU's campus uh, will be reopening, and you're, it's a free museum. You can come in and visit. Um, I work there, so I'm happy to show you guys around if you see me around the museum, but I will be working on a mammoth dig this summer, digging up some Colombian and woolly mammoths that I'm super excited about. Um, but yeah, uh, paleontology is great. You learn a lot of really cool stuff, uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. If you don't, that's fine too. Thanks, Molly. That's excellent. I, I do. I do have the field trip evaluation in the chat box. If you click that link and please uh, fill that out, um, that is how I'm. I'm checking to see how many people are on one of these calls. And um, also, there's an area for you to, uh, if you have any comments or questions, um, I can uh, I can answer those. If you give me some contact information. Um, and also, if you have any comments to make field trips better, or maybe you have a field trip that you'd like to go see sometime, um, you can also add in that comments. And Molly also uh, just added a link to the um, or Orton, um, yeah, the Orton Geological Museum um, at Ohio State. You can check that out. Uh, Ohio, obviously, Columbus is is well. We didn't get all of it. Yes. I was going to say Columbus is a lot closer to us than, than Australia, but uh, if you're in Australia, it's obviously not. So uh, um, if you do want to go down there sometime, if you're in Columbus area sometime, um, it's a really cool museum. And, uh, and you get to meet ha Molly in real life, in person. How amazing. <laughs> okay, I don't see any other questions from anybody. Thanks a lot, everybody, uh, for coming today. And uh, I hope to see everybody next week. Uh, and I'll, I'll announce.